God of mercy, full of grace, you are forever, always forever. So do anger, rich in love, you are forever, always forever. We hear your kingdom shout and all your praises ring. Let the heavens roar and go across the ground as your people sing of your majesty. Lord, hear the sound. Lord, hear the sound. God of mercy, full of forever, always forever. So do anger, rich in love. You are forever, always forever. Hear your kingdom shout and all your praises ring. Sing out the heavens roll and go across the ground. And as your people sing, of your majesty, Lord, hear the sound. Let the heavens roar and go across the ground. That your people sing of your majesty, Lord, hear the sound. Lord, hear the sound. everybody. Happy New Year 2023. You made it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's fantastic. First day of worship. First day of the new year. It all is in perfect harmony, isn't it? Yeah, we're coming to you coffee shop style today. So if you clicked in, welcome. Wherever you are, we're so glad that you made the effort to be in worship with us today. And everybody in the room, hello. It's good to see you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful on such little sleep, too. It's fantastic. <clears throat> All right. Well, we're going to continue worshiping together. We picked some older songs this morning, so you don't have to think as much. You can just lean back into your memory and just praise the Lord, right? So let's enjoy worship together. Let's give God the honor and praise that he's due. Here we go.
morning and like Christopher said happy new year okay first service said the same thing happy new year it's good to be together today my name is Wes Raspberry I'm one of the ministers here at Greenville Oaks and we're excited that you're with us this morning welcome to Greenville Oaks uh, if you're in the room or if you're tuning in online thank you so much for being here and worshiping with us today we especially want to welcome you if you are a guest we'd love to say hello and get to greet you and get to meet you uh, we're excited that you are here uh, if you didn't grab communion uh, on your way into the room, if you're in the room with us, they're at tables around the sanctuary here. Uh, I'd invite you to grab that as that time will come up here like we do every Sunday. And if you're at home, I'd invite you to gather those elements as we'll take that time here in a couple moments. Um, also want to re remind you that there's multiple ways to, to give. Um, you can give online, you can give via text, you can give in the boxes around the room. Uh, but thank you for, for continuing to support the work that God is doing in and through Greenville Oaks. And on that note, uh, I want to invite you back for the next three Sundays. We're going to focus on missions, and we're going to get to hear how God is calling Greenville Oaks to participate in missions um, here in Collin County, uh, in North America at large, and uh, especially in the, the Mediterranean Rim. So I'd invite you back for the next three Sundays as we'll focus on uh, missions together. Today is New Year's Day, and uh, just a, a couple things that, that come with that today. Uh, we will not have children's worship today, and there is not an attended nursery, just so you are aware. Uh, and finally, and last but not least, uh, I want to 
invite you to be a part of Financial Peace University. It'll launch this uh, Wednesday evening, January the 4th. And if you aren't aware of what that is, or maybe if you are aware, but you're not really sure, you've never done it before, um, this is a, a program that's produced by Dave Ramsey. And it's uh, it's actually been a blessing to my wife, Kylie, and I. We walked through it six years ago, uh, and I learned something called budgeting. Uh, but it's been a blessing for, for our relationship, for our marriage starting out. But it's not just for those starting out. Uh, maybe you got through this holiday season, maybe you got through Christmas, and you're wondering where all of your money went. Um, maybe you need to hit the reset on your financial plan, your financial picture. And so this is a great opportunity. Again, it's starting this Wednesday evening, January the 4th, and I invite um, all of you to, to, to go and look that up. Um, you can go to greenvilleoaks.org slash hub to check out more information about that. Now let's continue on in our worship together. All right, everybody, let's stand back up. Do me a favor. Take in a deep breath and let it out. Let's do that one more time. Breathe in and breathe out. First day of 2023. Imagine every day of your life being available to God for worship. It can happen starting in this moment. You can commit every day of your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord, and pouring yourself out in worship in every word, every deed, every practice, every moment, right? Let's sing to that effect. That's my goal this year, is to just be more worshipful. See 
my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Sing it out. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my
I love this church. Thank you. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> oh, man. I could do that all day long. And it is such a privilege to, uh, to serve the Lord with you. All right, I got to tell you something. The new year started off with a miracle in my life. Ministry can be a hard game, hard occupation. Um, and it's not without its bumps and bruises and, and hurts. And Greenville Oaks has been huge in healing me from past hurts. 
the most healing, the most loving, uh, the most restorative faith community I've ever been a part of. I'm standing in the midst of right this minute. But last night, a miracle happened. I was, um, I was about to perform a wedding, officiate at a wedding. And about an hour before the wedding started, my phone rang, text, a text to me and my wife from a, a former elder in a church that I served who probably hurt me more than any single individual on the planet. And he, and he texted me and he said, this is probably too little too late but I profoundly apologize for walking away from you in the hardest time of your life. I would like you and your wife to forgive me if you would. I'm truly sorry. Happy New Year. At least in, in my little corn kernel of a brain, that's a big deal. I told Keith earlier, I feel about 20 pounds lighter today. I don't look it, but I feel it. Um, and I texted him back and said, I'm about to do a wedding. My head is not in this space, but I can't imagine doing this wedding with this floating in my brain. So though this may never completely restore our relationship, I want you to know that I profoundly forgive you and be at peace. It gave me a, I didn't, I, I didn't necessarily want to do that. I kind of got blindsided and I thought, man, I got so much baggage I'd like to unload on this guy. But I just simply accepted the apology. And it made me appreciate how much God has extended to me in forgiving me. I have hurt him in, infinitely. And yet he continues to forgive and doesn't use as leverage all that stuff against me that he could have. So I just wanted to share that miracle with you and have us celebrate the miracle of the Lord's Supper together. It's profound what God has done for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Whatever sins you have in your past, maybe even some up until last night, God forgives. He pushes them as far as east is from west away from you every single day. And I want to encourage you to rejoice in that this morning, that there is power in the blood of Jesus. Let's commune together. Lord, thank you so much for this meal. It restores us. It brings us back to center. It makes us lighter spiritually. And for that, we're thankful. We take this bread together. We take this cup in remembrance of you, but also in celebration of the sanctification that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. The body of Christ. the cup of the Lord, the blood of Jesus. If you're age three through sixth grade, you get to stay here, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to encourage you to sing out nice and loud. Show your parents and guardians just how wonderful the Lord is, right? Yeah, let's stand and worship together one more song before Keith joins us to lead our hearts and minds.
go back to the beginning Can't control what tomorrow will bring But I know here in the middle Is the place where you promised to be
Give the Lord praise. Have a seat. We don't have a smooth transition other than to come on up, Keith, and do your thing, bro. ...around backcountry Israel. He was proclaiming one message over and over. God's kingdom is here. Through his own life, death, and resurrection, Jesus was making life in God's kingdom, the same kind of life he was living, available to us. This was the good news, or the gospel, that ordinary people, like us, can begin to live everyday life like Jesus. And this is the best kind of life there is, the good life, as some might call it. It's a life of conversation with God, joy that never stops, forgiveness for anything and everything, peace instead of anxiety, trust instead of fear, hope that will not fail, and love for others that never gives up, just for starters. A life radically different from anything we've ever known. you might have noticed a gap between the everyday life Jesus made possible for us and the everyday life each of us is actually living. Maybe you believe Jesus forgave your sins, but beyond that, it feels like not much has changed, except maybe how you spend one hour on Sunday morning. That's if you can find a place to park. Many of us are simply not living everyday life like Jesus, and we wouldn't know where to start even if we wanted to try. We feel stuck in the same old habits and are beginning to wonder if the life Jesus described and lived is actually possible. But what if it still is? Jesus didn't just proclaim the gospel, drop the mic, and walk away, leaving us to figure out how to live this life by ourselves. He invited us to follow him, or in other words, be his disciples, an ancient word that simply means student or learner. Discipleship, then, is the process where ordinary people learn to live everyday life like Jesus. It's an ongoing, lifelong process that bridges the gap between the life each of us is currently living and the life Jesus envisioned for us. Good morning, Greenville Oaks. Welcome to 2023. Uh, I'm Keith Maloney, one of the ministers here. Wade, our uh, regular preaching minister, is away visiting relatives this weekend. Uh, and we're really excited that he will be back next Sunday. So you want to come and, and be here for that. <clears throat> New Year's is the most universally celebrated holiday in the world. Almost everybody celebrates the beginning of the new year worldwide. Uh, and one of the things that we often do in the new year, because we've got this blank page, this fresh start, is we set New Year's resolutions. Now, I don't know if you're a resolution setter or not, but it's the thing that you do to try to get rid of some old bad habits and start cultivating some new healthier habits. And some of them are physically healthy, like uh, exercising more or losing weight. Uh, some of them are healthy in other ways, like uh, I'm gonna spend less, I'm gonna save more, I'm gonna get out of debt. Uh, there are some noble things that we can have at New Year's resolutions about, but some of them are not always so noble. Uh, read on per one particular website of some New Year's resolutions that they invited people to post. And somebody said, I resolve to stock up on fresh fruits and vegetables and eat them before they turn into green mystery goop in the back of the fridge. Another person said, I resolve to manage to go the entire year without accidentally telling someone random on the phone, love you as the call ends. Although the scheduler from my dentist's office did seem to appreciate it. I resolve to read more or at least turn on the subtitles while I'm binge watching TV. I resolve to carefully read all of the directions on a box of food before throwing it away so that I don't have to go garbage diving midway through making hamburger helper. I resolve to pick movies on Netflix swiftly and decisively so that you know I actually hit play before I go to sleep. I resolve to discover once and for all while it, why it takes three attempts to plug in a USB cable. I can relate to that one. I resolve to stop feeding the office plant leftover coffee. I'll use water instead. And finally, I resolve to stop lying to myself about New Year's resolutions. Some of us identify with that last one. Maybe I don't, I don't 
know about what resolutions that you make, but a lot of people, their view is resolutions, that doesn't make any sense. I know I'm not going to keep them. Why would I set myself up for failure by making a resolution that I know I'm going to break? All it's going to do is make me uh, feel guilty or it's an exercise in futility or at worst, it makes me feel ashamed because I'm more of a failure than I was before. Now, I don't know what your idea about resolutions is, what your view is, whether you're for them or against them. And I don't know that it makes that much difference, honestly. But unfortunately, many times we take that same view toward our own spiritual lives. I know I'm not going to be what God wants me to be. So why should I make this big effort to do it? Why would I start to do something that I'm gonna wind up banging my head against the wall because I know it's not going to be successful? I'm just gonna feel guilty about that. <clears throat> I don't know if it, if it matters whether you make New Year's resolutions or not, but taking that view toward our spiritual growth and development is really, really unhealthy. It's harmful because God wants us to change. You know, the deceiver is really good at what he does. Our spiritual enemy convinces us of things that are absolutely untrue. For instance, when it comes to how we see God, he's convinced a lot of people that God is some cosmic killjoy who is just waiting for us to do something wrong, to fail in some way so that he can punish us or make us feel guilty about it. That's absolutely not who God is. But the inverse of that is also untrue, that God is some heavenly Santa Claus who goes around smiling all the time, patting his children on the head, and he really doesn't expect them to become anything different than they already are. God's heartfelt desire for you and me is that we become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. Now, on our own, we're completely incapable of doing that. But God never asks us to do it on our own. Paul talks about this process of what it means to live out our lives of faith as children of God in Philippians 2. Beginning in verse 12, he says this, my dear friends, you always obeyed when I was with you. Now that I'm away, you should obey even more. So work with fear and trembling to discover what it really means to be saved. God is working in you to make you willing and able to obey him. Now, I'll confess, I really struggled with this passage when I was younger because I would read the New International Version that said it this way, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I thought, oh wow, if I've got to work out my own salvation and make it happen, I know there's gonna be fear and trembling because I know there's no way I can be what God calls me to be on my own. But that's not what Paul's saying here. Notice how he puts it, discover what it really means to be saved. And I'm firmly convinced that's not just something the Christians in Philippi needed in the first century. I think if Paul was writing a letter to this church, Greenville Oaks today, he would say the same thing. Discover what it really means to be saved. You see, a lot of people that I talk to seem to have two concepts of salvation, a past and a future. God has forgiven me of my sins in the past and I have a hope of living with him in heaven eternally in the future. And it completely lives, leaves out the in-between, the now, the here, the present. And that is absolutely a false view of what God intends salvation to be. The present is something God cares very much about. 
Paul describes the present as God is working in you to make you willing and able to obey him. I like the way the New Century Version translates that because God is working in you to help you want to do and be able to do what pleases him. This idea that it's all up to me, that I just have to gut it up and grit it out and make it happen by my sheer willpower is absolutely not something that God's word teaches us. But <laughs> Paul clearly says that God is the one who gives us not only the will, but the ability to become what he calls us to be. And what he calls us to become in simplest of terms is like his son, Jesus. Now, here's what happens in many cases, I think. Someone hears the good news about Jesus Christ and it just moves them deeply. And they respond accepting that, that word of grace and truth and they give their lives to Jesus and there's this incredible change and this shift in, in how they think and, and how they see themselves and the world. And they begin to do different things. They read the Bible. They love reading the Bible and, and reading other spiritual literature. They, they love coming to worship and having wonderful times of worship like we just experienced. They, they are serious about helping other people. They can't wait to tell some of their friends, some of the people they know of what God has done in their lives and what Jesus means to them now. And it's a wonderful time. And they begin to see their lives change. But then time goes on and things sort of settle into a routine. And that, that spiritual growth and development kind of stalls everything just becomes the way it always was. <clears throat> and they look at that and it's, as the video said, it's, there's this gap between what God describes our life to be like as followers of Jesus and the reality I see in my own life. Because in my own life, instead of becoming more and more like Jesus, what I see is I worry too much about my job or my money. And I get envious or jealous of other people who, who are more capable or more attractive and more successful than I am. And I, and I get real critical and I yell at my kids and I, I, I'm in judgment on people that don't live out their life of faith the way that I think that they should. <clears throat> And I see that gap and I wonder, I, why is that there? I've got to do something to fix that. And when we see that, how we react often is just by trying harder. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna knuckle down. I am gonna, I am gonna really, really dedicate myself to doing this. I am gonna make this happen. And we do. We decide we're gonna get up earlier and we're gonna pray more and we're going to worship more fervently and we're going to serve in the kingdom and we're gonna do all of these things. And we start on that road. And we hear about somebody who gets up at four o'clock in the morning to spend an hour in prayer before they start their day. And we think, that's what I need to do. And so we set the alarm for four o'clock and we wake up and I'm groggy and I'm dazed and I'm, bleary-eyed and I, I can't even think straight and I think Jesus is shaking his head saying go back to bed and get a good night's sleep you know but it seems it seems miserable and exhausting and, and I'm just you know it, it seems like all of this stuff and so it must be spiritual I think so I try to keep doing it and I do it for a, a few days or weeks or even a couple of months and then I'm just worn out and I read what Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I'm confused by that because I don't feel like I've got a light burden. I feel like it's heavy, it's weighing on me and I feel this guilt and I don't know what to do with it. 
So I feel the guilt and I rededicate myself and then I start it over again and I try for a while and then I get exhausted and then I quit and then I feel guilty and then I start over again. There's this just vicious cycle. Have you ever been there? And I'm confused because it doesn't feel like rest. It just feels really, really weary. Some people give up on trying harder and they just decide they're gonna pretend and they're gonna fake it till you make it. And every, every prayer is answered. Their life is full of miracles. Every decision is a word from God. They smile all the time and every other sentence ends with praise the Lord. But when they're alone and everything is quiet and they look deep inside, they realize nothing's really changed. Some people decide what they need to do is just have this incredible spiritual moment where they're moved to become a different person. That's really a specialty of student. When I was, when I was in the ancient times a student minister, a youth minister, boy, that's what we excelled in. We'd go on a camp or on a, on a retreat and have people, the, 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 the students there for several days and by the last night, we'd have this wonderful moving worship service and somebody would give an emotional message calling all of the students to come and give themselves to Jesus or to rededicate themselves to God. And there'd be a lot of crying because face it, we were sleep deprived by then, right? And a lot of hugging and everything was gonna be wonderful and we'd get on the bus the next day and everybody loved everybody and we were gonna be super spiritual saints and it was gonna be all great and it would last for a few days or a few weeks and then everything would kind of settle back down to the way it was. And some people have tried all of those things and they just give up. They just say, look, that's not me. I mean, God may do that for some people but I can't grow spiritually like that. And they're just resigned to their life being the same and no transformation coming. So here's the question for us as we begin 2023. What if Jesus really knew what he was talking about? What if it really is possible to experience God's salvation, not just from our sins in the past and our hope for eternity in the future, but right here and right now as a follower of Jesus Christ. What if it really is possible to become increasingly in tune with God and growing in love and joy and peace and spiritual maturity? What if Jesus came to die on the cross, not just for the past and the future, but to make us different today? In a sense, our call is not to transform ourselves through sheer willpower and trying harder or having some moving mountaintop experience. It's not just students that do that, by the way. Or pretending. Our task, our challenge, is to simply stay connected to God in his presence, in his power from one moment to the next, to the next and allow him to work in our lives. One of the most helpful truths that I have come to understand as a follower of Jesus is the difference in trying to do something and training to do something. When Paul wrote his letter to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse one, he says this. Therefore, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
In that passage, Paul talks about two dimensions of this transformation that God wants us to experience. He ends by saying, be transformed by the renewing of your mind because we have to think, we have to understand, we have to believe what God is calling us to do. We act based on what we believe. And if I believe something's an exercise in futility, I'm not gonna do it. I have to believe what he has promised. But that's just one dimension. The other is what he started with when he says present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's not believing. That's what I experience in my life. It takes both the belief and the experience to be transformative. <clears throat> Our experience is a major part of the transformation. Best illustration I can think of to help us understand that is, is learning to ski. I talked to somebody after first service that just went skiing this weekend, said it was great. When you first learn to ski, you take a lesson and they teach you how to put on your skis and they teach you how to get up when you fall down because you're going to fall down a lot when you're just learning and they, they teach you how to control your speed you, you hold your skis kind of as an inverted V make a wedge and you make a snow plow and you, you slow down or stop by doing that and it works if you're going relatively slow but it's really, really exhausting because you're using your own muscles, your own strength to slow down and stop. You're fighting gravity. If you get going too fast, it's not gonna work anyway. But later, as you get a little more accustomed to things, they teach you not to put your skis in a, in a V shape to snow plow. They say, hold your skis parallel and then turn and let the mountain stop you as you're going down. Now that sounds good. When they said that, I believed it with my mind because I knew enough about physics to understand that was plausible, okay? And I'd seen people doing it. I thought, boy, that looks cool. But when I got on those skis and they pointed downhill, it felt like I was gonna fly right off of the side of the mountain. I started going so fast. But you don't stop with them down here. You keep turning. And uh, you go across the mountain and slow down or maybe even up if you need to. And then you turn back. And it not only works compared to snow plowing, it's virtually effortless. It's amazing how great it is. Now, did I believe that was gonna work? Yeah, in my mind, I believed it. But the rest of me didn't necessarily believe it. My sweaty palms didn't believe it was gonna be okay. My churning stomach didn't believe it was gonna be okay. My rapid heart rate didn't believe it was gonna be okay until I did it for a while. And suddenly, because of my experience, I knew it was okay. In the same way, spiritually, Paul is telling us in Romans 12, yes, you need to believe this, but that alone doesn't do it. You need to experience it. You need to present your bodies as living sacrifices. One of the great lies that the deceiver wants us to believe is that it, information alone is enough to transform people. And churches all across the country just keep cramming more information into people because we can cram enough spiritual knowledge and awareness into people, they will automatically be transformed. It's not true. It doesn't work alone. <clears throat> Have you ever known someone that knew 10 times more than the average person about the Bible and God and spiritual things? but wasn't 10 times more spiritually more mature. They didn't love or believe 10 times as much. If information is all it took to change people, 
then we could eradicate, we could eradicate and eliminate drug abuse and alcohol dependency by just informing people of the dangers. But that doesn't work. We could eliminate poverty by explaining to people how to be self-sufficient, but that doesn't work. We could create wonderfully healthy marriages throughout the church and the world by just educating people on what you do to have a great marriage. But we all know that doesn't work. You have to put what you learn into practice. You have to experience what God is calling us to do. Romans, Romans 12 verse two in the Living Bible says it this way. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. And that is what we want to focus on in 2023. I wanna challenge every single one of us in 2023 to be learning from our own experience how his ways can bring a fresh newness in how we think and, and how we live so that we can be transformed into the image of Jesus, not by trying harder, not by pretending, not by some deeply moving experience, but by experiencing in our lives what God wants us to. It's not a simple task. It's not an easy one. Not gonna happen overnight, but it works. And God is calling us to be what he calls us to be, genuinely transformed into the image of Jesus. This is something that we don't do ourselves. God does it. But I've observed that God far more often does it in the lives of people who make themselves available to him to show us his way of life. In one way, I want to encourage you experiencing that for yourself is what we call here at Greenville Oaks the discipleship pathway. <clears throat> the discipleship pathway begins with the rooted experience. It's a simple 10-week process. It doesn't work magic. There's no grand secret. But it's a process where we experience what God is calling us to do as his followers so that we can become transformed. We're gonna begin that in a couple of weeks. At the same time, we'll begin going deeper. If you've already been through the rooted experience, I want to encourage you as strongly as I can to be a part of one of our going deeper groups at whatever stage you're at right now. But if you've never been through rooted, through the rooted experience, I wanna invite you to come and join us two weeks from today that on January the 15th at 3 p.m. down in the, in the student center because we are going to be having an information session. There's not a commitment there. We want to tell you about what's involved and rooted so that you can decide if that's what you want to do. <clears throat> going deeper starts the same week. I hope and pray that you'll prayerfully consider being a part of what God is doing in the lives of the people in this church. <clears throat> when you go through that, it doesn't work magic, but you learn to view scripture differently. You learn to pray differently. You learn to understand who God is differently. You learn how to view serving others in a different way. And it's a wonderful beginning. It's just an introduction, but it's a wonderful introduction to this incredible life of spiritual transformation that is the present part of salvation God wants every single one of us to know. 
It's a wonderful journey, and I'll pray you'll be a part of it. You can join us on the 15th. You can go online to the Hub and, and uh, register right now if you want to. But I pray you'll be a part of whatever part of that discipleship pathway is ready for you. Let's pray together. Father God, oh, Father, we thank you so much for giving us the desire and the ability to become what you've called us to be. We confess on our own, we'll never make it. Thank you so much for not calling us to do it on our own strength and by our own willpower. Father, we, we thank you for giving us your son and for calling us to an abundant life right now as followers of him. We pray that all that we do will be a glory to you and a wonderful encouragement to us and to others. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray and amen. Would you stand for our benediction? May God bless you in 2023 with a wonderful experience of having the desire and the ability to become what God is calling you to be today in this life. Go in peace and Happy New Year.